Oh, freedom. Oh, freedom. Oh, freedom over me. And before I'll be a slave, I'll be buried in my grave and go home to my Lord and be free. Oh, oh freedom. Oh, 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 freedom. Oh, oh, freedom over me. And before I'll be a slave, I'll be buried in my grave and go home to my Lord and be free. Amen to that. Let us give God a hand clap. I am Bishop Tony Branch. I'm going to do a brief invocation. I want to remind the people of God that the purpose of invocation is to open up this community congregation to his spirit and to his will, never forgetting the power of God. So as I give this invocation, regardless, it doesn't matter what your faith is, one God, one faith. Let us bow our heads and close our eyes and give reverence to God. Oh God, blessed be your name to your glorious kingdom forever and ever. God, your people come today in unity and in an unshakable will. We give you thanks in advance for what you will accomplish today. Oh God, with your ever-present spirit, we ask that you heal the victims of police brutality and hear their cries. Oh Lord, we ask that you seek a hedge of protection over our police officers and first responders, insulating them from harm. Lord, we ask that your spirit fall fresh upon our servant Robert F. Sullivan as he leads your city in a magnif magnificent way. God, your clergy, who come to you as your prophets, are united today as one. That your power and that your will will fall upon the people today. Lord, we don't leave here in weakness, but we are strengthened by your power. Lord, we are united in an unshakable will. That it be done today, and that our community be protected and that justice be served for those who believe in a remarkable way. May the children of God say, Amen. Amen. Thank you, Bishop Branch. Good afternoon, everyone. We are so happy that you are here for this solemn gathering. On this occasion, we come together as the Brockton Interfaith community, members from different faith backgrounds, with one true and real hope. We're here today for a multi-faith gathering for justice. For justice. For justice. Today as we gather, we not only spend time making plain and stating candidly what we believe justice looks like, but we also come together as a people of faith to lament to repent, to cry out unto the Lord, 
to see his hand extend within our midst on behalf of those whom have been marginalized and oppressed. Within a city and a society where justice doesn't always seem to be served. I want to share with you really briefly what our purpose is for today. We're here to lament, we're here to repent, but we're also here to talk about some change, what that looks like and what that can be. So it's my prayer today that as we embark upon our time together, that as you are here, that not only are you fully here, but that today becomes a day that sparks a renewed involvement and commitment to being the change that you desire to see in your city, in your country, in your world. And on that note, I'd like to call forth Sister Michelle, Pastor Anne Marie, Rabbi Ken, Pastor Dan, and Pastor Jeff. George Floyd's murder on May 25th, 2020, there were at least 1,068 people killed by police. 1,068. An average of three killings every day. Even more disturbing is that this is the normal rate, consistent with data from previous years. Something needs to change. We want to honor all who have lost their lives, but giving only one second per name, we would be here for over 18 minutes. To honor those who have been most targeted and abused by the police, we will read the names of the 229 black people who were killed by the police in the year following George Floyd's death. Despite only making up 13% of the US population, black Americans are nearly three times as likely as white Americans to be killed by the police. A further analysis found that black people were 35% more likely to be unarmed and 36% less likely to be threatening someone when killed. These names are from May 26th, 2020 through May 25th, 2021. And there have, more, there have been more killed since then. Here are the names of the 229 black people who have been killed by the police since George Floyd. Tony McDade, AKA Natasha McDade, 38. Modesto Marrero Desto Reyes, 35. Reuben Smith III, 35. Jarvis Sullivan, 44. Terrell Mitchell, 34. Momodu Lamin Sisse, 34. Derek Thompson, 46. David McHattie, 53. Taquan Graves, 33. Kamal Flowers, 24. Louis Ruffin Jr., 38. Philip Jackson, 32. Michael Blue Thomas, 63. Richard Brooks, 27. Kane Van Pelt, 23. Donald Ward, 27. Brandon Gardner, 24. Tehran Jamal Boone, 31. Derek Canada, 43. Skylar Tongue, 31. Robert Delon Harris. Rashid Matthew Mormon, 26. Elosius LaRue Keaton, 58. Kevin O. Ruffin, 32. Kai Johnson, 31. William Wade Burgess III, 27. Joseph W. Denton, 35. Paul Williams. Malik Canty, 36. Errol Johnson, 31. Richard Lewis Price, 49. Hakeem Littleton, 20. 
Vincent DeMario Truitt, 17. Aaron Anthony Hudson, 31. Darius Washington, 24. Vincent Harris, 51. Jeremy Southern, 22. Name withheld by police. Chester Jenkins, 60. David Earl Brooks, Jr., 45. Darian Walker, 28. Ashton Broussard, 30. Amir Johnson, 30. Julian Edward Roosevelt Lewis, 60. Salathus Melvin, 22. Jonathan Jefferson. Raphael Javon Minifield, 29. Kendrell Antron Watkins, 31. Anthony McLean, 32. Adrian Jason Roberts, 37. Trayford Pellerin, Damian Lamar Daniels, Julius K. Name withheld by police. Michael Anthony Harris. Michael Robert, Wright. Earl Jackson. Reginald Alexander Dijon Jr. Gissi, Frederick Cox Dion Jr. K. Rodney Eubanks. Stephen D. Johnson. Kusumuzi Kunene. Major Brandon Cardo Milburn. Baldwin. Tracy Leon Steve McKenney. Gilbert. Angelo Jonathan A.J. Cruz, Sincere Robert Pierce, Coleman, Isaac Frazier, Arthur Keith, Sheik Wayne Mustafa Dale Davis, Davis by police. Shamar Shane K. Moses Jones, Jr. Markavis Rashad Park, Sean LeQuinn Brady, Larry Ham, Jason Bryce, Mohan Helen Arnell Jones, Jr. Kenneth Jones, Jason Cooper, Tyson Omaha, Ross. Nebraska. Reynolds. Jaquan Hayes, Donald Rodney Francis Applewhite, Shaheen Robert Jr. Terrell Smith, Chandra Moore, Law Gopi, Carl Dorsey is third, Fry, Jr. Legarian Smith, Corey Donnell Trujillo, Tricidarian Taekwon White, Mickey McArthur, Anthony Vincent Jones. Belmont, Eudofia Ekum Abbas, Sean McCoy, Nika Nicole, James David Robert, Holly, Lil Rob Paul Howard. Jr. Kevin Fox, Ruffin. Jason Nightingale, Dominique Darryl Harris, Matthew Leonard, Oxendine, Jordan. Maurice Jackson, Patrick Warren Sr., Kevin L. Duncan, Andre K. Lamond Sterling, Moses, Frankie Jennings, Casey Christopher, Christopher Goodson, Geiger, Jr., Jr. Vaughn Chadwell, Reginald Johnson, Malcolm D. Johnson, Zontarius Johnson, Donovan Bender. W. Donald Christopher Edwin Harris, Sam Saunders, Lucy Malik, Malik, Malik Cater Jr., Thomas Jr. Reader III, Tyree Kajan Rogers, Joseph R. Crawford, Andy Miller, Allen, Jr. Joshua Roger D. Hipskin, Charles D. Carl Jones, Marvin Edwards, Jr. Jeremy Daniels, Johnny Bolden, Green, Gabriel Casso, Larry Taylor, Desmond Montez Ray, Andre Maurice Hill, Dominique Williams, Andrew Hogan, Andrew Brown, Dustin James Lionel Johnson, Gregory Taylor, James Alexander, Jordan Walton, Raheem Reader, Brandon Wimberly, Deshund Tanner, Marvin Vega, Faustin Quitigo, Hanad Abidazis, Dante Wright. Terrence Miles Maurice Jackson, Parker, Matthew Zadok Eric Williams, Smith, Anthony Thompson Jr., Lamello Parker, Pierre Three Alexander Mons, Shelton, Latoya Dennis, Lindani Maini, Ines Lee Jr., Pinky, Roderick Inga, Adonis Trauberger, Larry Jenkins, 54. Name withheld by police, Kalan Horton. 29, Lance Lowe, 30, Tyrone Penny, 21, Darian M. Lafayette, 24, and Courtney LaShawn Warren, 23.
peace, beautiful people. I'm gonna say that again, peace. I'm getting ready to do our faith, re uh, our faith reflection. And uh, the tradition of Brockton Interfaith Community, we do faith reflections. These are opportunities for us to take different scriptures from different faith traditions across our world, to bring it into the presence of ourselves, and to think and look at how it applies to the situations that we find ourselves in. I by no means am trying to offer uh, an interpretation to try to persuade anybody to become anything but who you are. I am gonna come from the tradition that I'm most comfortable with, which is the Christian tradition. And I'm gonna read a scripture from Ephesians chapter six, verse 12. The scripture says, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. I don't know if y'all heard all those names. It would have been impossible for you to hear them all because in order for us to get it in the time we needed to get it and we had to say them all at the same time. Something's wrong. And what I think is profound about the scripture that's being, that I'm offering in this particular moment is that you can't pinpoint it because it's not attached to a human being. You can't say it's this person here or that person there. The scripture is, is advising us to look deeper at what is going on in our society that is allowing so many deaths to happen. It's looking at structures, y'all. Are y'all hearing me? It's looking at structures and systems that exist. Why are we here today? We're here today because the structures and systems that exist even here in Brockton are set up in such a way that people are dying. And at the very least are feeling unsafe. We're here to interrogate how did we get here? And we're here to offer two solutions to the myriad of solutions that I think we need in order to tackle this thing. Two solutions that we can offer to allow us to start to get to the process of doing two things. One is heal. And we can't heal it if we won't acknowledge it. So first, we got to heal. We got to acknowledge that it's happening. And we got to start the healing process. But two, is we got to create some systems and structures that create true accountability. We have lost that. And I'm unafraid to say it out loud. So today you're going to hear some testimonies. You're going to hear some, some, some facts about some of the pieces and you're going to hear some, some asks. Last thing I want to say, I want to share a story to just ground this. Because I see my wife and my, my son over there. When we first got here, we came and we were at a, a, a we were driving home, we had just gotten out of church. We're Seventh Day Adventists, so we got out of church around uh, at, a, um, at around 12 o'clock. We were coming home, and we decided we were gonna drive through our neighborhood. Driving through our neighborhood, just kind of exploring. We had just gotten here, we're brand new. As we were driving around, I could see that a police officer was following us.
I could see that a police officer was following us. I looked in my rearview mirror. I told my wife, I was like, we're about to get pulled over. Before I could even say it out loud, the lights came on. Now my wife at this particular time is pregnant with my son. Y'all could look at him, he's the cute little boy with the salmon. That's one of the loves of my life. He's, she's pregnant with him. He walks up to the car. Now we hadn't, we hadn't done anything. And he acknowledges it when he walked up to the car. He walked up to the car and he said, where are you coming from? What are you doing? What are you doing in this neighborhood? Well, I, we're driving around our neighborhood, exploring our neighborhood to get to know our neighborhood. He says, well, I noticed, you know, your car looked kind of suspicious. You had out-of-state plates, and we wanted to make sure that you weren't out like looking for drugs. Yeah, he said that. Now, I'm furious at this moment in time, but of course I know that this is an unsafe situation, so what do I do? I eat it. I eat it because my wife is in the car, she's pregnant, and I don't want anything to happen to myself or her. He walks back to the car, he runs my, uh, runs my license, everything comes back, gives me the license back, and he says, you know, I'm gonna let you guys go, as if he's doing me a favor. I'm gonna let you guys go. And, uh, you know, he, he was like, you know, you could, you could understand, like, the out-of-state plates and the, the you, know, you, know, I, you know, I couldn't really tell what you guys were up to. You could understand why I pulled you over, right? and I had to eat it again. No, I don't understand why you pulled me over. I wasn't doing anything wrong. Instead, we just ignored him, took, our license, took my license and we went home and it messed up the rest of our day. That situation could have gone poorly just by pure virtue of us being fed up with what we're experiencing in our communities. There is a structural issue, y'all. Pay attention to the scripture I read. Something's going on. And it's more than like a bad person. It's a bad system. I pray that you heard me in this particular moment and I, and I wish peace and blessings on each and every one of you. Good evening, good afternoon. I've been saying good morning. Good afternoon, everybody. We are here today because we want change. And how else are we gonna be effective in seeking change if we don't have the people amongst us? So we're here today to give our testimonies about the things that we have experienced in relationship to police in our community. We should not be waiting for one of us Brocktonians to die before we change the infrastructure of our municipality. So I'm gonna tell a story about 17 year old Bree. When I was 17 years old, I was already a teen parent and I was homeless at that time. Typically, during this period of time, I would steal. I would steal out of necessity. I would steal out of need because I had lack of resources or didn't know where to go obtain certain resources. So at this time, this particular incident that I'm gonna to speak to you all about was a time that I deviated from that narrative and didn't steal out of need, but out of greed and wanting to be down with my friends at this time. But like I stated, I was already a teen parent. So I didn't have the luxury of just being a kid with no responsibilities. I had grave responsibilities at this time. 
And during this particular incident, while shoplifting with some friends, we were caught and apprehended. And it appeared that, you know, the loss prevention office was gonna give us a slap on the wrist. That they were gonna take our information and kind of let us go, you know, these knucklehead kids. But unfortunately, the people that I was with, they weren't so humble to just take that slap on the wrist. So a situation that could have, you know, ended in one way, ended in a completely different way. Not to mention, I had my newborn daughter with me. She was about seven months at this time. And because of that, especially, I knew that caution was needed when handling this particular situation. But like I stated previously, it was out of my hands at this point. The person that I was with became irate. And as a 17-year-old parent, I saw an escape to run and I took it. Unfortunately, but very quickly, I came to my senses and stopped running and took a seat across the area from where I was. When the police got up to me, because they had already come on scene at this point, when the police got up to me, I said that I wanted to give my daughter, because she was in my hand, to a superior officer. I didn't want to just give her to the person that was there that would obviously have their hands tied up with apprehending me. So I'd imagine that once the other officers come in support, they would, you know, put me into cuffs and I'd be processed. And again, I did do something wrong. So I was not unclear about the process that was going to take place. However, when that superior officer came and I passed my daughter over to them, that was then followed with me being thrown into the mulch someone's knee being placed in my head, handcuffs were already on me at this point, and excessive use of force. A loss of dignity as you're out already doing what you're doing and you've already gone through undignifying things to try and seek whatever it is that you need. But this excessive use of force, I remember being so upset because as I was down on the ground and this officer's knee was in my head, I remember feeling like a gusher, like my head was going to explode. I'm a 17 year old girl, probably no more than 150 pounds at that time. And I've got a grown man's knee in my head. I remember wanting to take action thereafter and go report it. But I remember who's gonna protect me in the process of reporting? What process is there to report? Will anything actually happen from here? So I'm here today not to tell the sob story, not to tell a story to brag about anything that I did as a knucklehead kid. But I'm here to say that today my voice is gonna be used to seek justice. And what that justice looks like is new structures of accountability, like a civilian review board so that officers can be held accountable by the community that they are supposed to be protecting and serving. As well as that looks like say in a use of force policy because I had none in how that officer dealt with my body. So with that being said today, we are here to ask you all to listen to these testimonies and think it could be me or it could be someone I love. We have some young children in the audience, it could be them. And at what point do they turn from our little cute babies to threats to society? I'm Coach Bree Nichols, and today I am here to seek accountability and reimagine what we see as community safety. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. As you heard, my name is Rob Conley. I'm a pastor here in the local city of Brockton, the great city of Brockton, the city of champions. And I'm so, as Pastor Manny would say, elated to be in front of you today. Before I tell my story, 
I want to mention two things so that we can ground ourselves in the right reasons for why we are even collected here today. There's two things that I want to make sure that we understand before I go forward. The first thing is, we cannot sit by and watch injustice happen in our city. I believe in God and I believe God has given us the opportunity and the ability to make a change in our world. If we sit by and watch injustice, we are wrong. If we sit by and allow the same mess to continue, we are wrong. If we just ignore what our brothers and sisters go through, we are absolutely dead wrong. We must be a part of the solution. That is the first thing I want to make sure we understand before I share my story. The second thing I want to make sure that we understand is something that connects to an opportunity I had this morning to, to preach the word of God and to speak about generosity. And we call it loving without strings. Giving to somebody else, not wanting something in return. And I learned that from my God, that he loved me in a way that he didn't ask for anything in return. And for us to be people who believe in God like that, we must love others without wanting something in return. We must love people who don't love us without wanting an apology in return. Without them wanting us to be forgiven. We shouldn't want anything in return. So the second thing I want to make sure that we understand is that if you hear my story and you ultimately end up hating white people or hating police, you are wrong. If you hate somebody else who's different from you because you've been hurt and you lash out on them, you are wrong. So we can't sit by and allow injustice to happen. But when we do speak up and stand up, we can't do it in anger. We must do it in love. So respond, but respond in love. Now let me share my story. And I'll try to be brief. In 1993, when I was 15 years old, here in the city of Brockton, I lived on the north side of the city. Standing outside with a group of people that came from the Cape Verdean background, we were standing waiting to decide who was going to take the bus in order to go to the mall to rent a video game. I was standing outside with a bunch of friends, well, a lot of people who I just knew because they lived around the corner from me. My friend stood next to me with a cast on his leg. And there were a number of Cape Verdeans who were standing around us. At the time, gang violence was heavy in our city. So little kids were mimicking what they were seeing in the city. A group of seven to nine year olds came around the corner and said, hey, we are a gang, we're gonna fight you guys. And it happened to be the brothers and the cousins of the older Cape Verdean males who were standing next to me. These were not my brothers or my cousins. I paid them no mind. They walked around the block, came all the way back around the block as we were now figuring out who's going to take the bus to go get our video game. The kids came back and they said the same thing. We're a gang. We're going to fight you. Their older family members started play wrestling with them on the street. Then, as crazy it may sound, these kids picked up their family members, took them across the street, and tied them up to a telephone pole. I stood there next to my friend with the cast on his leg and said, these guys are crazy. Then, they tied, after they tied them up to a telephone pole, just to make fun of them even more, they pulled down their pants and, and started pointing at them and laughing at them. At the time they pulled down their pants, cruisers came around the corner. At the age of 15, being nervous and scared, I did what I think any other 15-year-old kid would do. I ran. Ran to the backyard with one other kid. The other kid who ran to the backyard with me happens to also be somebody who wasn't related to those young kids. We ran to the backyard, we hopped the fence, and all of a sudden, a German Shepherd came and grabbed my friend's leg, and then an officer said for me to come, turn around and go back to the scene of the crime. The other kids who actually were playing with their family members ran into my friend's house 
And when they came out afterwards, we were already handcuffed by the police. We were put in the back of the cruiser, and the cop untied the kids. It was two cops. And one of them brought a kid to the window and said, did this guy do this to you? And the kid said, no, he had nothing to do with it. And the cop said, shut up. Yes, he did. He did this to you. They proceeded to take me to the police station. And my mother had to pick me up from the police station later that day. Went to court later that summer. And the charges were kidnapping because the kids were taken across the street. Mind you, the reason why this all happened is because next door, a white family saw what was happening and thought it was a gang fight. So they called the police. So the charges was kidnapping because the kids were taken across the street. The second charge was assault and battery because they had rope burns on their arms and their legs from the rope. And then indecent person because they were caught with their pants down. These were the charges that were put. Went to court, everybody testified and said he didn't do anything. But for some reason, even after that, I ended up having community service. Mind you, 15 years later, the whole time actually, the whole 15 years, there were a number of people, as I worked in the city and became a man of faith and tried to help people in the city, who thought I was a child molester because kids were caught with their pants down. Mind you, I didn't do anything. I was standing next to my friend with the cast on his leg. And then as I tried to be an advocate in the city and as a man of faith, helping out some kids who were in hard times, they went into a transition home. I said, let me go and visit these kids in the transition home. And they said, sure, we just got to check your court. I said, no problem. They said, excuse me, the next day, can we, can we talk to you about your charges? So I dealt with the scar for 15 years of something I did not do. And because I work in the city, I have a friendship with a number of police officers. And I spoke to one police officer who told me, man, as I saw your police records, this is my supervisor and this person's racist. So again, as you hear my story, it should tell you that we can't sit by and watch injustice happen but I challenge you to do the same thing I did and respond in love. I don't need an apology from the police. I don't want them for me to give them some kind of forgiveness. I'm already forgiving you for what you've done, not because of who you are, but because of who my God is. So we want to respond in love, but we must act. I hope my story and my faith reflection encourage you to do the right thing in the right way. God bless you. I thank you both, both Pastor Rob and Coach Bree for sharing. It helps to place in context some of the things that we Unfortunately, have continued to see take place in our city. At this time, we're going to invite you all to actually just take a couple of moments and get with someone nearby. And I'd like for you to have opportunity to talk about what is your impression of what you've just heard? What does it say to the city that we live in as well as some of the needs that we continue to have as it pertains to seeing justice enacted and taking place in our city, as well as what it speaks to and is required in regards to the systems that perpetuate some of these things still happening. I'd like for you to stand up, if you would, and since we're outside, I'm gonna invite you to pair up with somebody whether it's someone you know and you came with or someone you don't necessarily know, I'd like for you to have just a couple of minutes to have an opportunity to converse about what you just heard and what you believe is required in this moment. So go find a neighbor, ready break, and we'll come back in a few moments. We are out of time, family. But the sense that I gather is these conversations could continue in large part because clearly
there are some needs. At this time, it's my esteemed privilege to introduce to you Pastor Jeff, who will be sharing in a limitation. Thank you, Pastor Manny. My name is Pastor Jeff Cardisco. I am the pastor at Christ Congregational Church, United Church of Christ, here in Brockton. And uh, to Pastor Rob's story, I am a white man who's never been harassed by the police while horsing around with my friends in town or while that happened nearby. So in that spirit, as Will said when we got here, we're here to lament and we're here to repent. And so I invite all of you to be in a posture of prayer with me now as we pray for repentance and out of lamentation. Stand up and praise the Lord your God, for God lives from everlasting to everlasting. May your glorious name be praised. May it be exalted above all blessing and praise. You alone are God. You made the skies and the heavens and all the stars. You made the earth and the seas and everything in them. You preserve them all, and the angels of heaven worship you. Almighty God, you made Brockton with its people and places and opportunities to experience your presence. We praise you for this place that we call home. Even in our mistakes, you don't abandon us. You're here with us, and we praise you. For centuries, we have sinned against this land you made and the people in it. We have not recognized creation as your handiwork. We have not recognized all people as children of God. We have not recognized your creative hand in the uniqueness of all cultures. We've tried to make your kingdom into our kingdom. We've set a standard that values people matching to our likeness instead of yours. We've disregarded the very humanity of many of your children, our siblings. In this place, we have been self-serving, we have been arrogant, and we have been violent. In this land of the free, we have held our siblings captive. They have not been free. We have not understood that our freedom as your children is collective. None of us have been free. Throughout centuries and decades, in your mercy, you remained with us and did not abandon us in our sin. You heard the cries of the oppressed. You gave prophetic words to those who would listen and strength and vision to those who would act. Through them, you brought change to systems. You broke down barriers. You gave some the eyes to see your likeness in every one of our siblings. You moved us closer to freedom for all of your children. But still we are not free. We are proud and stubborn. We haven't paid attention to the new things that you were doing. We quickly, we quickly forget that freedom is possible and move instead toward complacency. We've stayed separate from each other when we worshiped instead of working to be one body. Some of us live comfortably while others are harmed and oppressed. We've strengthened the systems that held some down and have given power to those who would abuse it. We conflate our faith in you with faith in systems. We combine our worship of you with our worship of our nation. We have thought of ourselves as superior to others, refusing to look in the mirror and see our own faults. We've stood idly by while this system we created imprisoned and abused and murdered our siblings. We're shocked to see the very breath of our siblings extinguished, unwilling to accept our own responsibility. We have not been free. One year ago, amid the horrors inflicted on our siblings by our systems, we saw glimmers of hope. We listened to each other. We reflected and repented of our own sins. We raised our voices and called out the sins of our systems. We sought accountability from our leaders. We had difficult conversations with those around us. We took knees and prayed together. We experienced displays of unity and heard promises of change. We experienced your profound presence when we came together. 
We accepted your correction as an opportunity to turn and correct our wicked, wicked ways. We saw glimmers of what could be. But still, one year later, we are not free. We've been willing to wait for justice instead of listening to your voice telling us to move toward justice. We've been willing to accept peace as the absence of conflict rather than the realization of justice. While we've each feared and worried about our individual health in the face of a pandemic, we've been blind to the sickness plaguing our community. While we've bemoaned feeling trapped while staying safe in our homes, we have not freed our incarcerated siblings. While we've been faced with our own mortality, we still have not valued the lives of every person created in your image. We've been willing to accept the fact that not everyone is free. We've turned our backs on your law and submitted to the law of our land. We are still not free. God, in our time of trouble, we cry out to you. In your great mercy, lead us to liberation with the help of prophetic voices and leaders and communities. In your great love, be patient with us. Help us to listen and to see. Help us change the systems that oppress and help to abandon our wicked ways forever. Created in your divine image, let us be a vision of redemption for your world. In the presence of your gathered people here today, strengthened by the light of your eternal faithfulness, we repent of our shortcomings together in the hope that through your eternal power, a day of peace and justice for all of your children will be realized. Amen. I'm Rabbi David Jaffe, Secretary of the Board of Brockton Interfaith Community and co-leader of the Kurji Caucus. Today in the Jewish tradition is a fast day. Uh, it's a fast day because uh, many, many years ago, Moses came down from the mountain talking to God and broke the tablets. Why did he break those tablets? Because he saw in front of him the people worshiping a golden calf. Worshiping a golden calf was an attempt by people, by humans, to try to control God and to say that God is not above us, we are going to make God. Many centuries later, the Roman Empire, the empire of the day, came to Jerusalem and they destroyed God's house and they burned it. And the beginning of that destruction also started on this day. That was another attempt by empire of the day to say, there's not a God above us, we are the God. There is just one power. There's only one God. How does this relate to us here in this country? The attempt, what white supremacy tries to do, is to control black and brown bodies in an effort to say there's not a God above that makes every human in divine image, but we're God. And we're going to control things the way we need to control them. And that control plays out through our policing systems and through all kinds of systems in our society. And there's good people involved in all these systems, but they're systems of oppression and domination. And when we're in situations of domination that result in what you heard and the stories you've heard today, we need to cry out to experience this and to hear these things and to know these go on in our society and not cry out and raise up our voices is an act of cruelty. And in biblical times, the prophets told them what people would do is they would take the ram's horn and they would blow it and they would blow trumpets and they would cry out to the heavens, why is this happening? This has to stop. And they're crying out and opening up the heart was part of changing their deeds and their actions. Because if we don't change our actions, the system's just going to keep going on. So I invite you, if you're here and we've all heard today, to join with me. Please stand. I'm going to blow the ram's horn. And after I finish blowing, I invite you to reach into your hearts and to cry out. That cry that's there the cry of pain, cry of hope, cry of just the things have to change. And if you want to grab someone's hand or you're with someone and do that together, I invite you to do that as well. So I'll blow this shofar first and then we'll cry out.
Good afternoon, friends. My name is Anne Marie Ilsley. I'm a pastor here in Brockton and a member of Brockton Interfaith Community Bo the Board. There's a story in the book of Nehemiah, a story of a community that is wrestling with itself, wrestling with itself in the hopes of building something that is more just, a community that is wrestling with building and recreating itself in a way that allows everyone to thrive. And Nehemiah, in this book, he invites the community to gather together, to give an oath, to make a promise for their intention to be part of this. And he gathers everyone. He gathers the religious leaders, and he gathers the political leaders, but he gathers the whole community. And he invites them to make an oath, an act of accountability. But knowing that words are not always enough, he invites them to practice a ritual with him. A simple act, a way of indicating their commitment to continue wrestling, to continue rebuilding. Friends, we are also a community that is wrestling and trying to make something that is more just. You've heard the stories we've heard today. Many of you have your own stories. We know we need to build something better than this. To build a community where everybody has the opportunity not only to survive, but to thrive. To feel safe. Rabbi David and I would like to invite you into an act, a ritual, a way of noting that we need to be in this together. Because if we want to change this, if we really want to build something, it's going to take our religious leaders and it's going to take our political leaders and it's also going to take all of us. I heard you cry out. I heard that lament. Lament is the first step of this. I want to invite you now into committing to take action around this as well. So the ritual that Nehemiah does in chapter 5 is he takes his cloak and he shakes it. He shakes it off. And he's saying, like, just like uh, dust is shaking off, we don't want to be shaken off by God. And we're thinking about this as a ritual of accountability of those community, that whole community coming together and shaking the cloak, saying we're shaking off our indifference. We're shaking off any ways we don't hold each other accountable in love and in justice. And so I want to invite everyone now who's here, everyone, all of our people, citizens, political leaders, police officers, everyone who's here to stand up and to find a place that's on your garment that's comfortable for you to do and to shake it, and as you're shaking it, imagine that dust of indifference and the dust of accountability, of lack of accountability coming off, and we're shaking that, and we're shaking it to be shake free so we can all hold each other accountable in justice. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name's Helena Fernandez, community organizer, a fund development organizer for Massachusetts Community Action Network. Today I'm here, I'm here to tell the story of my aunt, Maria Grassa, my great aunt. Maria was a sweet, gentle, very loving, strong individual. She would always be seen wearing a smile. After all, her last name is Grassa. It's been over a year my family and I are still looking for answers. After the tragic loss of my Aunt Maria Grasa, it's hard to begin the healing process with all these questions lingering. You see, Wednesday, December 11, 2019, my aunt left her home roughly around 2.30 in the afternoon. 
She lived directly across from Vicente's Tropical Grocery on South Main Street. She was independent, smart, strong 75-year-old woman. She loved going for walks, doing light errands with little to no help. She went into the grocery stores that afternoon to pick up milk and bread and a few other items. She managed to shop successfully and proceeded to make her way home. She left the parking lot of Vicente's and managed to walk more than halfway across the street. To the other side of the intersection. This is always hard because her last step never touched the ground. Instead, her body was thrown, flipped, and brutally severed and impacted by Brockton police cruisers doing well over 80 miles an hour in a 30 residence road. Her body was driven to BMC, where she was pronounced dead at scene. It was unusual for her to leave her home and not update her husband or her family on her whereabouts. She was missing for shy over an hour before we got the call from her husband, Jose, asking me, Helena, did Aunt Maria stop by for an afternoon coffee? Did you stop by just to say hi, considering we lived a few minutes away from each other? I said no, she didn't. Panic began to settle. As we dispersed looking for her, as we dispersed looking for her, we are, I was hoping, I was praying that she took a wrong turn. She took a, made a left on the wrong street and somehow, some way, derouted herself. Not once did I imagine she could have been involved in such a tragic accident, involved people who sworn to protect and serve her, that they would be the ones to take her life. Pass so quickly. Let's keep in mind, before my aunt, there was Mr. Tavares, killed on the same street, by the same manner, by a Brockton police cruiser. How many other names? How many other names is needed? How many other hurts do you need to inflict in order for us to see change? The city, no condolences, no sympathy. I've seen trash bags. I've seen animals get cleaned up, get attention more than our family ever did. They turned around. They made an argument for the funding of $10,000, as if her life, Mr. Tavares' life, or anyone's life is worth $10,000. What is $10,000? I repeat, what is $10,000? I personally have so many questions. While the case is still under investigation, the details are very limited. To the local police department, you have protocols for everything under the sun. What are your protocols for when you cause injury and hurt to those you pretend to protect and serve? How do you assume accountability? One officer to a call at the cost of someone else's. How, I repeat, how do you avoid this from happening again? And for the city, how can a shopping area be so poorly infrastructured with no sidewalks, no regulations of speed, 1.4 miles of no traffic control, completely neg neglected? And why was your officer traveling at such speed, given the dynamic of the neighborhood? She was well past the halfway mark, you guys. She went in for milk and bread. You have resources and places for officer involved. But what have you done for us? What have you done for my family, Mr. Tavares' family, 
and every other family who has to go through similar situations like ours. The trauma, I personally, of walking into BMC, identifying her, she had no ID on her, trying to puzzle the pieces of her face to make fit, to confirm to the family that she is who she is. I personally have witnessed your aftermath and your negligence. In the midst of this all, I felt outnumbered. I felt like I had no one to turn to. We know well that police police themselves, meaning they take care of themselves and they look out for one another. It's time to have a committee for the public to provide a clear channel of communication and bridge in the gap. We need someone to act on our behalf, acknowledge my pain, my trauma, and my voice, just like Dark did for me. Thank you. My name is Pastor Mark Oliver. I'm the pastor of Trinity Baptist Church on the south end of town. And just hearing the uh, three testimonies today, it just, it tells me, it's a reminder for all of us, it's why we're here. It's why we're here. Uh, as good as this city of Brockton has been, it can be much better. And it needs to be better. Uh, we, we need to, and we call ourselves the city of champions. and. What we know about champions is that they don't quit working hard. They don't quit doing what needs to be done to become the champion. And we need to do the same. And we are being challenged. So I thank you for each of those testimonies. I want to read a scripture verse familiar to many of us. It's Psalm 127, verse 1. Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman keeps awake in vain. And we are clearly reminded that as, a, as leaders, as community members, if our first objective is not to make God known and to lift him up, and to abide by his wisdom and his statutes, uh, we labor in vain. We labor in vain. I've been asked to briefly acknowledge some of the things Mayor Sullivan, Chief Gomes have, have already done. And the reason I started with this particular verse is because one of the things that I appreciate about our mayor is that he understands that truth. He understands that unless God is first, we labor in vain. Unless his life is first about God, putting him first, he labors in vain. And unless we put the Lord first, our ability to guard our own city, to protect our own, uh, we labor in vain. So I wanted to start there because one of the things that I believe is that God is sovereign and when God is working, he raises up the leaders we need to bring us through that change. And I personally believe God is escorting all of us to what sometimes we call a, a Kairos moment, a time when God is making it inevitable to change. And we have that opportunity now. But one of the things I appreciate about Mayor Sullivan is because of his, his own humility, he understands what many urban sociologists call the, call the, the, urban, the urban trinity. 
and the necessity of the urban trinity. And the urban trinity means that the peace, the collaboration, the working together between three essential entities, the priests, the politicians, and the police, the urban trinity. And what I have observed is that we have leadership who understands that, who understands that there needs to be collaboration between all three uh, to be able to bring the change that I believe God wants to see in this city and for the very reason we're here. It is in that that we are beginning to see movement and change. Fast enough? No. Deep enough? Not yet. But it's coming, and we're working at it, and that's why we're here. But I'd like to acknowledge at least a few things um, that I've observed out of a, a man, a mayor, a man of faith, who's learning, who's growing to be a leader and to be uh, the person that God wants, is that humility. I saw a year ago, I saw a man during uh, uh, that, that, I don't remember it was June or, or, or what specifically, but certainly uh, in, that, in that swell of Black Lives Matter, I saw a mayor get down on his knees and take a knee with others who were yelling out and lamenting. I've seen a mayor want to make Brockton better and know that he's, he must talk with everybody. He must meet with everybody. And he's doing that. Some of the, the things that I was quickly writing that I know about, first of all, I do know with very quickly, he was about putting together the community justice task force and assigning this task force to, to leave no, nothing unturned and, and take a look at our systems, our, our social systems and, and do some critique, listen to the community and get, get input, valuable input to humbly move forward and where we need to change. I, I, I know that, that that came out of his own pledge with the Obama Foundation and the My Brother's Keepers Alliance and he's wanting to keep that pledge that he's made and to pursue racial justice in our city. I know that there's been initiatives in the school uh, working, working uh, with the, uh, uh, the, the, the educators who are committed to embedding diversity in the way we do school, in the way we, we do education, and working hard in, in that. Um, I know that there's there's uh, the, uh, the 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 launching in the fall this past fall the diversity race equity and inclusion subcommittee who are assigned to continue to to look through and how we can get better as a community in the whole area of education and if I if I'm if I'm remembering correctly an executive director has been hired is that is that I'm remembering correctly is is uh, is Renee Haywood somebody who's been hired to oversee that to do that. So I just wanted to, to make mention briefly that uh, we are fortunate to have a leader who, who knows how to lament with us, is lamenting with us, and wants to do what needs to be done so that we can be the city that God would have us be. Hello again, my name is Pastor Manny Daphnis, Pastor Restoration Community Church on the East Side, and I also serve as the president of the board of the Brockton Interfaith Communities. It's really my honor 
and privilege to stand before you here today along with my colleague, my girl, Ms. Izzy. As we've come to a place where we have the opportunity to go from acknowledging some of what has transpired over the course of this last year, and also pointing out and making some pretty clear concrete ask about what still needs to go forth. On June 25th, 2020, George Floyd was brutally murdered. A number of clergy gathered together right here on these steps in short term we called Mayor Sullivan. Mayor Sullivan graciously said, come on down. And we took a public stance on that day. We stated that injustice can't continue to go on in this way in our community, in our city, in our world. And as such, on that day, we gathered here on June 1st, 2020, after the murder of George Floyd. And we made two asks on that day. The two asks that we made were that there needs to be a community oversight review board in our city, which Sister Helena alluded to just a, uh, just a moment ago in her testimony. But in addition to that, there also needs to be a community process in which a use of force policy is revisited and looked at in a way so that community has the opportunity to give input upon how we are treated. On June 1st, as we gathered here publicly, that ask was made and when that ask was made, our mayor, as well as police chief Gomes, listened, they heard. Yet we're standing here today because we haven't quite yet seen these asks truly addressed. And there continues to be areas that have yet been changed to bring about the type of change, safety, really hope, and ultimately respect and dignity for our people. And so today, we have the opportunity to take a few moments and we are happy that our mayor is here. We have the opportunity to make some concrete ask today. I contend to make some concrete demands as a people. After we have opportunity to make these asks, we're going to invite our mayor the opportunity to respond. Mayor Sullivan, we thank you for being here. We know, we know that there has been some progress made as a result of some of your efforts. And we want to certainly take a moment to acknowledge that just as Dr. Oliver has we understand as well that there are areas that continue to require some work and time. But these asks are too important to allow to go forth without there being some time placed around them to see these changes made. So at this time, like to ask our first ask. 
It reads as follows. Our first ask is as follows. Mayor Sullivan, we want to see a community review board established by Labor Day that is tasked with recommending officers to be sent before the post commission and that will track and publicize the investigation and consequences given to these officers. This board will preferably have representation from active community organizations, including big and dark and the like. Mayor Sullivan, while we know a post commission has been established at the state level, we understand and know that what is required is that there be a community entity and brew that is able to actually put forth some names of officers to ensure that the policing of police isn't happened just by police. But community is actually given a stake and an opportunity to actually speak their mind and voice their opinions and ultimately see justice served. So with that stated, Mayor Sullivan, will you commit to establishing a community review board by Labor Day of 2021. Mayor, please come. Thank you, thank you very much everybody. I wanna first of all thank each and every one of you. Um, I had to leave, I had to go to the VFW for another city event that came back here. Um, some people are gonna be disappointed pointed by my answer, but if you know me, uh, I speak the truth. I can't say yes or no at this time, and I'll tell you why. I want to tell you why. For six months, the Community Justice Task Force vetted out certain things and reported back to me. Pastor Rob Conley was a member. Bickett suggested he was awesome. Pastor Mark Oliver served, and six other members. It took him six months, and I got it back about a month ago. And I have hired an outside attorney to help me on that. I also have Manny Gomes, the police chief, sitting in on meetings, and, and Bridges, uh, Megan Bridges, the city solicitor. I just don't think that it would be the right thing to say yes, because I don't want to disappoint anybody. We're better together, and if you know me, you know I speak my heart. I'm a Christian. I pray with Pastor Manny every other Friday, and I have a Wednesday call with all the pastors. So all I can tell you this is just, and, and people aren't going to like this answer, but it's the truth. Just give me a little more time because we, as a community, need to get it right. And I will come back and see you in four weeks. I will make that pledge right now. But I would not ever want to say yes or no, and then all of a sudden it comes back and it doesn't come to fruition. We need to make sure it's done right here in Brockton, and as long as our mayor, it will be done right. I've disciplined police officers since I've been in a, uh, the mayor, and that's a fact. But I just want to tell you right now that not just as a Christian or a dad or as the mayor, that's just my title, but as a Brocktonian, as a white guy that grew up in Brockton. I need to listen and learn and pray, and that's why I'm with Pastor Manny. But I can't say yes or no, and that's just the honest to God truth at this point. But if you give me four weeks, I'll come here, I'll come to wherever you are, and we'll have something that I think everybody in the city of Brockton will be proud of. Mayor, Sel mayor Selvin, please, yeah. please remain. I've got, this mic's not working. Mayor Sullivan, I've got a couple of follow-up questions sure. relating back to this same initial question. Sure. First question, why this four-week time frame? Second question, Mayor Sullivan, in all due respect, for many of us, for many of us, we feel like we've been waiting a lifetime. And the reality is, in order to see change take place, what really firmly needs to happen is your leadership to take a stance where justice lands. And in our estimation, what's 
pretty plain where justice lands is at the place where the community has a voice and input upon what actually happens in terms of how they are treated. Would you like to respond to that? I, I just came up with four weeks. Listen, this should have happened years and years ago. I, I, I understand that. I do understand that. But I also know this, that I need to give the respect for the eight members that came back with a plethora of recommendations. Police reform, education, business, health care. And, and to just say I can do that today is just not fair to them. It's not. It's not. That's, that's just the truth. So I can tell you that we are making changes. The post commission is coming down. The 2020 police reform bill is coming into effect as well. Um, and Brockton right now, I can tell you one thing that we did, and I see Tina Cardoza here, and I want to thank the city councilors. Um, we have the funding right now. One of the recommendations was a cadet program for boys and girls in Brockton. It comes into effect July 1. That was a recommendation that's coming into effect. Don't use military grade uh, weapons. We, we don't use that. I made a pledge when the Community Justice Task Force sat out here three weeks ago that the use of force policy in Brockton will be revised. The last time it was edited was in the year 2013, too long ago. So I, I might not have all the answers for all of you today, but I can just tell you that I want to continue to work with you. That's the whole purpose of what a community is. From BIC to the Latin Women's Association to the NAACP, we all have to work together for the right thing, and Brockton can be an example in the Commonwealth faster. Community, what we've heard and have the opportunity to hear is the mayor's response as it pertains to community oversight board. I just want to be clear. What I'm hearing in your response is that there's not a commitment yet to see this come to pass. Rather, what I'm hearing in your response is there continues to need to be some sort of process. Mayor, what I'd like to ask is several things, really. How long? What's this process look like? Is community a part of this process? Because at the end of the day, lives are at stake. Community is always part of the process. And that goes back to my first thing that I did as mayor pre-COVID. We had a community engagement meeting at Brockton High. That's the first act I did as mayor. And when I was able to get the eight volunteers for Community Justice Task Force, and Mark and Robbie here, um, we asked for community input. So over those six months, it just wasn't eight people. It was community engagement, community forum. So community is why all of us serve, either the cloth or here at City Hall. It's why we serve. So all I can tell you is, change is coming. It's not as quick as some of you deserve. I, I understand that. But I can just tell you, and look you all in the eye, is my word is my bond as a man of, of, of religion, as a Christian. But again, all I can tell you is that we, the city of Brockton, needs to continue to work together. We will have community, community input, but I just don't want to misspeak or give people false hope. We have to continue to do that, Pastor Manny. Thank you. Our second question. Our second question is going to be led and read by Izzy. Before I transition there, however, I want to make one thing plain here. There's a process that's going to go forth as we've heard from our mayor. But I want to state this and state this plainly. We've been hearing that there's a process going forth for a long time. And in a lot of ways, that's why we're here. There needs to be accountability. There needs to be clarity. There needs to be expectations so that we actually know what this process that goes forth looks like and entails. Hi. My 
name is Isabella Katsky. I am a resident of Brockton. I've lived in Brockton almost my entire life. I'm going into eighth grade at Cliff Academy. I'm a member of Restoration Community Church and a leader with Brockton Interfaith Community. Yes, And I am here because I want my family, my friends, my community, and myself to feel safe. I'm also here because young people's voices are often overlooked, and I'm demanding that we be heard. As you heard earlier from Pastor Manny, we have been meeting with Mayor Sullivan for a year now regarding the use of force policy, and it is time to do more than talk. The purpose of the use of force policy is to indicate if it is at all necessary for the police to use force against a person in any given situation, as well as, deter as to determine in what way police should use that force and which type of force they are allowed to use. In other words, it is the policy that decides whether the police can put their hands on our bodies or use their batons on our bodies or use their guns on our bodies or tasers or rubber bullets or tear gas. In almost every city in the entire country, this policy is decided on and created by the police only. This means that the police get to decide what they can do to our bodies and when they can do it. They can also decide whether they are accountable for what they do to our bodies. I want my parents to have a say over, ha over what happens to their bodies. I want my brothers and sister to have a say over what happens to their bodies. I want to have a say over what happens to my body. The community should get to decide how the police will engage with us. We should have a voice in this process. Mayor Sullivan, we want to see the police use of forest policy rewritten with community input through a process led by active community groups, including BIC, in partnership with the police department. This process should be completed by October 1st, 2021. Will you commit to establishing such a community process to be implemented and completed by October 1st, 2021. Mayor Sullivan, as we put in our email, you will have three minutes to respond. At the end of the three minutes, we will prompt you to prompt you that your three minutes is up. In those three minutes, we are looking for a clear yes or no. Thank you. Come on. Thank you, Izzy. If anybody was at the uh, the forum at Restoration about the school education art camp recently with Superintendent Tossin. She was an all-star there, uh, she really was, so thank you. Um, I, I can just, again, say the same thing that I said before. Number one, we are gonna be reforming the police use of force. As a lawyer, uh, you know, I'll put my lawyer hat on right now, something that was uh, generated and executed in 2013 is long overdue. Uh, as the mayor, I've already made representations to attorney Lenny Keston and attorney Megan Bridges that we need to do that. Um, I, I can just tell you the same thing that I said before. We have to make positive changes, right? But I cannot commit to a specific drop dead deadline at this time because again, if I fail to meet that, then, then I've misled, I've lied, and I'm not gonna do that. All I can tell you this is, we are gonna have positive change. I'm coming back before you, if you'll have me. I, I need to have input, but I've never worn a badge in my life. So if I sat around a table to give ideas, it's not gonna be fruitful. But I want to hear from people that have had interactions. Pastor Rob Conley shared with me a personal thing that I never had experienced. But Rob shared it with me, and he did so. And I'll, I'll never forget what he shared with me. So what I can say to you right now, Izzy, is, is I will work with you. You're the next generation. I'm an old man. But, but my three kids and you are the next generation of Brockton. So I will work with you. I will work with the youth in Brockton. I've done that. And all I can tell you is the specific date that you're asking for, I can't commit to but I can commit to having input from you and other people in the community that's gonna help us foster something that's beneficial to all. And I think I met the three minutes.
we are slightly over our time allotment. I'm gonna ask that you give us a few more moments. Friends, what we've had opportunity to hear is a mayor who is expressing a desire to work with community. But what we've also heard from our mayor is an open-ended time frame that doesn't give us clear results. I want to make sure y'all all heard what I heard. That being the case, what I want to really reiterate here is that it takes community to build community. And it requires our continued involvement and support to actually go forth and see some change and actually be the change that we desire to see. I could just ask as a so now I went to Mass this morning at 8 o'clock. I'm going to ask right now that we take a moment of silence. It was to start it off and have the names read was, was shocking for all of us. But we've also here in Brockton lost 434 residents to COVID. Every day at 4 o'clock I was getting the death count and it was the worst part of my job. It was tragic. So could we just please take a moment to remember the 434 residents that were lost to the deadly virus? Thank you. Thank you. I'm Pastor Dan Lee from Brockton Covenant Church from the South Side. Today we remembered and heard the 229 names of the black people killed by the police following George Floyd's death. And we also heard from Coach Bree her testimony, seeking accountability. We've heard Pastor Rob's testimony. While it was painful, he's still calling us to respond in love. Let's remember that. We've repented together. We've lamented together. And lamenting requires truth-telling, and you have heard the truth. What did you hear? How does it sit with you? We have heard from Rabbi David and Pastor Anne Marie looking for accountability, reminding us that Nehemiah gather his community to demand accountability and that needs to come from us. We have heard Helena's testimony of Aunt Maria's story, still looking for an answer. Can you feel the pain that she is feeling? If you did not have, and do not have the answer today, how would that change you? How would you respond today? We have heard from Pastor Mark reminding us what Mayor has done. We honor you, Mayor, but we need more. You have heard us asking two concrete asks, and you are here for it. And you have also heard Mayor's response. Isabella, Izzy, reminded you and us that she wants her voice to be heard. Do you want your voice to be heard? Is that okay with you that our voices are not heard? What will you do? What did you hear? What's happening in your heart? What is being stirred up in you? What response will you, will you have? And what action 
will you take? We have an opportunity to move into that, that will hear the call to action. And I'm gonna invite Cindy Williams to come up and lead us into that conversation. I just wanted to take that moment to look at all the beautiful faces that are here, sitting in their power of support in this public action. My name is Cindy Williams, and I am a member of Restoration Community Church. I am a Restoration Community Action Leader emphasis on action. I am a Brockton Interfaith Community Leader, emphasis on leader. We have heard a lot today. And I've been moved by the stories that I have heard. And the way I see it, I see this as a time of urgency to move into action. I see this as an opportunity for each and every one of us to stand in our God-given power because we would no longer be told to wait. And I understand there's a process, but we will no longer be told to wait. We will no longer be told to be silent. We will no longer be denied of our presence. And my heart, Helena, goes out to you. And I say to you right now, I am so sorry, so sorry that you are faced with that kind of pain. Her pain could be any one of us today. We heard the names that were spoken, so many names that couldn't even be announced today. What signifies to me, that could be my brother, one of my nephews, perhaps my grandson, one of my neighbors, my church family members, and I don't want to be in another public action where names are being called out to that degree. We know that our city government has not done enough for the people of Broughton, and they don't listen to our demands when we make them. So we are, and I'm here, to ask each and every one of you to step into your power, your power of support. We are, and when I say that, and this is what I mean, we are building towards three principles, and this is Operation Power Shift. What we want to do is shift the power back into the hands of the people where it belongs. But that takes not only myself, but that takes you, 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 and all of us. That takes us demanding what we want and to be heard. These are the three principles that we are working towards. Number two, have the power to influence policies. We have a right, we have a right 
to be a part of the process. If we want to be the change we want to see, then we have a right to have the input on policies that affect our bodies. Like Izzy said, I want to say over my body. I want to say over my grandson body. I want to say over what happens to my community. Because just like Izzy, I want to be in a place that I feel safe to live in, to thrive in. So I'm asking every one of you to come along and be a part of shaping this city to be the place we want to live in. The third thing that we are asking is that we want to influence the hearts and minds of Brockton. And by that I mean, we all have the power of influence. So we want you to take what you heard today and tell your neighbor that's not here today, talk to your family members that's not here today, your co-workers, the people that you care about. And we asking, we asking that we all get involved. There is a QR code in your bulletin or program. And what I need you guys to do right now for me as a show of support, as another step into your power to take out your foes and that little camera icon that we usually use to take selfies i need you to click on this qr code and it's going to lead you into some links that has other information for you to get involved in there's also going to be a rally tomorrow right here at 6 p.m. I need you guys to show up. I need you to tell someone, someone to come along and be a part of the change that we all want to see, that we all need to happen. I need you guys, somebody, all of you, take my right hand. Let me know that you're going, you're going to stand with me to be a part of that change that we want to see. My love hand. Take my love hand and let me know that you're going to be a part of this policy process that we are trying to make happen for all of us. It's not really just about a black and brown thing. It is a people thing. And yes, the emphasis are on the black and brown bodies today, but we are all residents of Brockton, whatever your background is. So I implore you, I implore you, if you are tired, because I'm tired, I'm tired of waiting, how long do we have to wait? How long do we have to wait? We have the power within ourselves to do something about the problem. So I'm asking you all, let's be a part of the solution. Thank you, Operation Power Shift. It is on. We heard a lot today. We're going to go before God and we're going to pray as we leave. And my prayer is that this prayer would uh, set you in a place um, knowing where God wants to take you as we leave this place today. Amen? All right, let's go before the Lord. God, we want to ask your peace and your blessings upon those who had um, lost lives, those who are suffering, those who are hurting, those who are waiting for an answer. Those who are not privy to you are providing an answer for their pain, for their hurt, for their depression, for their loss. We're thankful, Lord God, for those who 
have attended today, and even those who are watching on their devices. We're thankful, Lord God, for those who agreed with some speakers and disagreed with others. We're thankful for those who may disagree with some of the speakers up here, Lord God, that they allowed themselves to just hear. We're praying that this is a sign for future unity. And we're praying, Lord God, that these words don't go in one ear and out the other. Father, we pray that you would have your way, Lord God, that we're asking to have an answer of what happens to our bodies. We're ultimately praying that you will be the one to direct our bodies into how we should act. So we thank you for this moment, and we pray that you'll cover us and bless us as we go. And go in peace, and go with God. May the Lord bless you.